Bible says, as the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. Do you have any idea what that means? What does it mean that a deer pants for the water? Does it mean he's just thirsty? He's desperate. It's the only way he can get the scent off of him before a predator catches him. And he's got to get to the water to lose it. You got to run into Jesus. You got to run to the Holy Spirit. It's the only way you're going to find relief. Now, tomorrow night, I'm just going to give you this. Actually, tomorrow morning. This morning, we started on the glory of the Holy Spirit. We're going to finish that tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. Tomorrow night, we're going to be speaking on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And you may think I know everything about that. I guarantee you, you don't, because I don't. And uh, actually, as I did this study, as I said yesterday, I, I looked, this says. This, this study has over 73,000 words, 131 pages, and I haven't even scratched the surface of the Holy Spirit. But we're going to talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Wednesday night, we're going to talk about the gifts, all nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. It will be a night of impartation because the gifts are imparted. It's not the only way you can get them, but it is one way that you can get them. is through the impartation of laying on of hands. But tonight, we're going to talk about that you can be filled or full of the Holy Spirit. Now, there is a difference between being full or filled of the Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They are not the same thing. They are two separate things, and we're going to, we're going to cover tonight the filling part, and tomorrow night we're going to cover the baptism part. And so, what happens is, is that when... Any new believer, any new believer can be filled with the Holy Spirit without having the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This is something that starts at salvation. It is something that comes and it gives you the ability to live a holy life. I don't know how Christians can walk around if they're truly saved and are filled with the Holy Spirit and say that this life is hard. I'm sorry, you must be reading something different than me. That doesn't mean there's not times where things are tough, but I'm telling you that there's always victory, that you're never defeated, that the Holy Spirit on the inside of you gives you the power to live a holy life. The baptism of the Holy Spirit comes from an encounter with the Holy Spirit, and it gives you the ability to live a life of power. So in other words, you can be full of the Holy Spirit, have, have the ability to live a holy life, but not have the power of the Holy Spirit to walk in signs, wonders, and miracles. And because that we don't want to do that, this is where denominations and different people will say the works of the Holy Spirit in signs, wonders, and miracles went away with the apostles. Except early church history shows us that that's not true. I had a thought that came to my mind, but I think it left me. <laughs> so you can be a holy person that has no power. Or you can be a person of power that has no character. God's plan from day one is for you to be a powerful, holy person of character. Amen. John 14, 16 and 17 says... This is Jesus talking. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells in you and will be in you, dwells with you and will be in you. So Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to comfort us and to help us. He dwells with us and he dwells in us. This is the promise of Jesus to us. And up to this point in the history of mankind, he has yet to break one promise. Amen. And I don't think he's going to start now. I could be wrong. No, I can't. This is one thing he cannot do. 1 Corinthians 3, in chapter, chapter 3, verse 11. 
It says, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest. For the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that is anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only through, as through fire. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. Let no one deceive you. Let no one deceive himself. If any among you thinks that he is wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is folly with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. So let no one boast in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cyphus or the world or life or death or the present or the future. All are yours, and you are Christ, and Christ is God's. The moment you get saved, the blood of Jesus makes you into a temple of the Holy Spirit for the Holy Spirit to dwell in. They had a temple that was built over in Jerusalem. And the most holy place was the Ark of the Covenant. That was a representation of the Spirit and the presence of God. They weren't to do anything. When they would go across the Jordan River, the Ark went first because it was the presence of God. When they would put the Ark in a pagan temple, the gods within that temple would bow down to it. And they're not even real because the presence of God overruled them. This is a picture of the veil being torn during the death of Jesus. The temple has been opened. It has been made clear that you can have the Holy Spirit. He can dwell inside of you. He never, God's plan was never for it to dwell in a house made by man. Amen. That's what he told David. He said, that's not my desire. His desire for it was it to dwell in us. You have to build your life on the word of God. This is the only way that you can make yourself a temple, a place where the Holy Ghost can dwell and stay. What you build on the foundation of your life will determine what dwells in you. And this will be revealed by fire. This morning we were talking about the glory of God. And one of the ways God reveals his glory is through fire. Fire comes to purge. Fire comes to reveal. Fire comes to show you what really is on the inside of you. It will consume everything that is not of God, and it will leave you in a place that if you don't have anything that's of God, you're naked. And so what the Holy Spirit begins to reveal is what, will, what the fire will not consume is the gold, the silver, and the precious stones. What he's not, he's not talking about physical things. He's talking about the works that you're doing on this earth. The things you're actually going out and doing. Are they gold, silver, and precious stone? Or are they wood, hay, and whatever the other one was that I just lost it off of my mind. Straw. Straw. Thank you. Which one are you? It's fire now or fire later. You can either have the fire of God now that will consume all of those things that are not of him so that only the good remains, or you find yourself in the eternal fires of hell where there is no getting out. I would choose fire now. Well, I already have, but I was saying that for you. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 says this. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Now I'm just going to say this, and it may offend you. I don't really care. 
Alcohol does not glorify your body. I'm actually going to get to this. I could go really deep in alcohol. I could show you everything that there is and why it's wrong. I could show you all the disbelief that you think the Bible talks about alcohol, but you have no concept of it. I could do it. As a matter of fact, last year was in a tent meeting. Two nights, God told me to talk on it. I thought, what in the world's going on here, God? Two nights in the same tent meeting, you're going to have me talk about alcohol? Well, there was a man in that meeting. He had been recently saved. He had been drinking. From that tent meeting to this day, he's never touched alcohol again. There is no study today by anybody. I don't care if they're saved. I don't care if they're the worldliest person in the world that says any amount of alcohol is safe. There's not one study out there. Drugs, cigarettes. I'm sorry, that is a destruction of the temple that God has given you. You were paid with a price, and it's the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Well, does that mean I'll go to hell? No, doesn't necessarily mean you'll go to hell. You may, you may go to heaven a lot quicker, though, because it, it can kill you. It says this, if anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved. This is, I'm not talking, look, there's nothing good at the end of alcohol. This is what my pastor says. He was in a foreign country, and they were, they were okay with that. And they kept nagging him and nagging him and nagging him. Get a drink, get a drink, get a drink. He finally said, fine, bring me one. He goes, but before you do that, let me explain something to you. At the bottom of that cup is boxing gloves. Are you ready for that? He goes, because I will turn angry and mean if I drink. They left him alone. Sin never gets you, gives you a free ride with God. When you defile your body deliberately after receiving a knowledge of the truth, the Bible says in Hebrews that you are profaning the blood of Christ and you're outraging the spirit. You were bought with the precious blood of Jesus. Glorify God in your body. Sexual immorality does not glorify God in your body. I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's a man and a woman, a man and a man, a woman and a woman. I don't care what it is. If it's sexually immorality, it is not glorifying God, and it is sending you straight to hell. Y'all get quiet on me. Ephesians 2.22. In him, you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Now, if you read Ephesians 2, verses 11 through 22... You see that at one point we were all strangers to this earth. We were strangers to God, separated from God by our sin. But while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Well, I just got to get my life cleaned up and then God will accept me. No, it's not how it works because you'll never get your life cleaned up. No amount of works, no amount of you trying to, to earn God's love in the flesh will ever do it. You just have to receive it. It's that simple. The cross destroys all confusion. It destroys everything we believe that separates us from God. It destroys all hostility. As a result of this, I see it every time somebody comes up here before me and says, I want to accept Jesus Christ and they mean business. They receive a supernatural peace. They don't know what to do with themselves. But all of a sudden, things begin to make it make sense to them. If you are without peace, then you are confused, and there's a hostility that's breeding on the inside of you. It might not have manifested yet, but it's breeding. The blood of Jesus makes you a temple, and the Holy Spirit dwells within you. And this, let me just give you a couple quick things of what it looks like. Number one, when you have, when Jesus makes you a temple and the Holy Spirit's dwelling inside of you, just like I said, Jesus destroys all confusion and hostility. What's wrong with you, boy? I'm going to say it down, but I can't reach the thing because it's broken. <laughs> so you called Esther? No, I called Glory. Which shade is it? This one right here. <laughs> she couldn't stand on the chair? Why did I do that? <laughs> <laughs> Are we good now? Yeah, we're good. All right. Number one, Jesus destroys all confusion and hostility on the cross. Number two, the proof of this is an individual's life is perfect peace because Jesus is our peace. 
Number three, we're no longer strangers or sinners. We're no longer separated from God. We are now children of God. Number four, our foundation is built upon the apostles and prophets, which is the word of God. And Jesus, who is the word, is the cornerstone. So you're building a house. I tell people that are getting married, what I recommend to them is I say, wait at least a year before you add children to the mix. Now, is it wrong to do that? No, it's not wrong to do it. But what happens is, is you both come in with separate foundations within Christ if you're saved when you get married. And you have to figure out how to put those foundations together into one because now you're no longer two separate people, but you come together as one. And so adding a child to the mix is still a blessing, but it does make it just a little bit more trickier to figure that out. That's me talking. That's not the Bible. That's just my experience. I tell you that up front. If you don't like that, throw it out the door. Let's keep moving. God builds you into a dwelling place for himself. By doing this, he is building a structure that comes together, and it is known as the church. If you allow God to build you up, there should be absolutely no division within the church. If there's division in the church, the person who's creating the division is the one who's operating in the flesh. This is why I said at the beginning that our ministry is called Life Together. And the reason is, is because I don't really care. I don't care what denomination you may be. I don't even know what that is. Good. I don't really know what it is either. I don't care what church you go to. I don't care how long or if you've ever been saved. I don't care if you're full of the Holy Ghost or full of the devil. If you're full of the devil, we'll get the devil out of there and get the Holy Ghost in. It doesn't matter. It's about togetherness. That's why I said, when we're in a city, I, we try to get different people to come. As a matter of fact, they drive an hour and a half sometimes to show up in a meeting. She drove up, brought a couple people with her last year up to Van Wert, Ohio. Yeah. I think she felt showed up because two of them drove down here to the meeting here last year. <laughs> <laughs> yes. God gives the Holy Spirit without measure. You cannot receive more of the Holy Spirit in the sense of, I know we say you want more of the Holy Spirit, and I get that. And what we're saying is that we're going to allow God to unlock things that we're not allowing him. The Holy Spirit's there. It's just a matter of, are we going to let him have more of us? So technically, he's getting more of us, not really we're getting more of him, so to speak. You have to make room for the Holy Spirit in your life. You have to continually add to your house. It's kind of like putting room additions on your house daily. You have to remove all the places that are not at peace in your life. We have to remove all the areas of confusion. This is how you make room for the Holy Spirit and why the blood has never lost its power. Amen. Romans 8, 9 and 11. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If, in fact, the spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. I'm going to say that again. It's the word of God. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, you do not belong to Jesus Christ. Am I reading that incorrectly? Somebody told me I'm reading that wrong. Is that what that just said, or is, am I making things up? Anybody? Okay, just making sure I'm reading this right. Should we go to 14 different translations to see? Romans 8. I'm in verse 9, 10, and 11. But if Christ is in you, Although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Oh, I thought you were going to tell me I was wrong. The only way that you can no longer give an opportunity to your flesh is through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's the only way. It's the only way. If the Holy Spirit is not operating in your life, then your flesh will operate. So how do you feed your spirit man? How do you feed the Spirit of God in your life? By the Word of God. The Word and the Spirit always agree. 
The word of God is never a burden. It's never a yoke that, that it, it, it is a yoke. He doesn't say, listen, he says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He doesn't say there's no yoke and there's no burden. A lot of places now, they want to preach that there's no yoke, there's no burden. No, this thing is yoked on me. I am yoked to this word. Where this word, if it tells me to go this way, I go this way. If it tells me not to do that, listen, I understand that my life is not a bunch of do's and don'ts. But there are do's and don'ts. The only burden that this has is for me to make it my brains. Make the Bible my brains. If you don't have a life in the word, then your understanding will always be skewed by your circumstances and by your situations. And this will breed confusion, not only to you, but to those around you that you begin to talk to. Well, I know the Bible says that, but this happened. No, the word of God trumps that. Well, I know the word of God says that, but I turn off right there. I'm not going to listen because you don't know what you're talking about. The Holy Spirit can keep you in all righteousness. The Holy Spirit can give you power over every work of the flesh. All you have to do is feed yourself on the word of God. Yeah. Ephesians 3, verses 16 through 19. That according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with the power through his spirit in your inner being. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength, in, strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the bread and the length and the height and the depth. To know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. That you may be filled with the fullness of God. You have that, every person in this room has that opportunity. With the Holy Spirit dwelling in you, you have the opportunity for Christ to dwell within your heart. Why? So that you can be grounded in love. So that it strengthens you to know the depths of God's love that surpasses all knowledge. And no, me and Julie do not talk about what each one is going to say when we get there. Last night I did a verse that she gave to Scott before the service started. It was in my notes. I didn't add it. I didn't do anything. It was there. This is all there. I haven't changed anything. I can go and show you the date, the last time I added to this, and it was not today. When you allow the Holy Spirit to look into the depths of your life, the anointing that the Holy Spirit brings begins to break every yoke that is pulling you away from God. Every yoke that the enemy has placed on you, everything that the enemy places on you and tries to pull you over here to sin and pull you over there to sin, the Holy Spirit comes in and he begins to break those yokes so that you're no longer pushed by every wind of doctrine. And your eyes begin to be enlightened by the fullness of God's love for you. 2 Timothy 1, 13 and 14. Follow the pattern of sound words that you have heard from me and faith and in love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. So not only does the Holy Spirit open the door for healing in your life, he deposits the good things of God into your life, and then he protects that deposit. That's pretty powerful. So he, he heals the darkness that's in me, he then plants in there the good things of God to replace that with light. And then he sits there like a security guard, but not some lame one, like a mall cop. <laughs> he sits there like it's Fort Knox. And you ain't getting any of this gold because it's better than gold to keep it within you. So what's the deposit? The deposit is the pattern of these sound words. The Bible is that pattern. The Bereans went to the scriptures to prove Paul wrong? No, the Bible says they actually went to the scriptures to prove Paul right. I said this morning, I said if Paul ever disagrees with the Old Testament, that is what is known as a false prophet. But the Bereans went and studied the Old Testament to prove Paul right, and they found that he was right because he doesn't disagree with the Old Testament. You can believe whatever you want. The deposit is faith in Jesus. 
Jesus is the author. He wrote into you what faith is. He finishes what faith is in you. He started it and he finishes it. Hope and faith have the same source. And that source is the word of God. I've had many people say to me, well, I just don't have as much faith as you. Well, that may be true. I don't really know. But I know where my faith came from, and you have the same access to it, so you can get to the same place as anybody. Faith comes by the word. Jesus is the word made flesh. When faith and hope come together, they begin to produce miracles in your life. The Holy Spirit protects the hope and the faith in your life. And the blinding has begun over there with the sun. Another thing that he deposits in you is the love of Jesus. God is love. That great love was poured out on the earth in Jesus. And it results in the fact that... How was I going to say this? Anything that is sustainable in your life, anything that is lasting in your life that's good is because of God's love. Any other focus will bring results every now and again. A blind old squirrel can find an acorn every now and again. But if you want consistency, you need the love of God. Faith works by love. Faith, hope, and love all follow the pattern of the word of God. The Holy Spirit delivers this all to us, and then he guards over it. James 4, 5. Or do you suppose it is no purpose that the Spirit, or that the Scripture says, He yearns jealously over the Spirit that He's made it dwell in us? So not only is the Holy Spirit guarding that deposit, but the Father is yearning jealously over the Spirit that's within us. So not only do us have to, the enemy wants to get something from us that God has planted in us, he doesn't only have to go through the Holy Spirit to get it out of there. He's got to go through the Father. And the only way he can have access to any of that is if you give him the access. And you say no. The Holy Spirit is the main thing. God is very clear in Scripture that the temple, whether it's the building or us, was and is not the main thing. We're not the main thing. If you go read about Josiah, who was a king, he thought it was all about the temple. So he started rebuilding the temple and doing everything. And guess what they found? They found the word of God. They pulled that out. They began to read it to him. And he said, oh, my goodness, it's not about the temple. People will get into trouble when they lose this focus. They lose perspective. They begin to talk about themselves. There was a preacher not too long ago. Everybody flocked to hear him. They would go up to Toronto to hear him. They would go to this place to hear him. They would go to that place to hear him. People come to me. you got to listen to him. I thought, I can't stand it. Why? What's wrong with him? Oh, he does talk about himself. Those are red flags to me. If a preacher, listen, you can get up and tell a story or two, but when the majority of your sermon is about yourself, I hope you leave here and say the majority of the sermon he quoted from the word of God. I want to start with the word, stay with the word, finish with the word. Needless to say, he fell. I'll leave it at that. Because he talked about himself. You get into trouble when you lose focus of what the main thing is. So now let's look at being filled or full of the Holy Spirit. You mean that's all that was, was your introduction? Well, kind of. I will say this again. There's a difference between the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the filling of the Holy Spirit. In Acts 2, 4, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Every baptism is a filling, but not every filling is a baptism. There's one baptism and many fillings. As I mentioned before, and we're going to talk more about tomorrow, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the initiation into the school of power. But fillings take you beyond that. 
A person who receives the baptism must still be continuously filled with the Holy Spirit. God wants your cup to overflow. So how do you measure fullness? The only way you can know something is full is if it's overflowing. That's how you measure fullness. If you want to be full, you have to be overflowing. And as humans, we leak. That can be a good thing and a bad thing. There was a pastor in a, in a city in California. He was standing in line. I believe he was at the grocery store or something like that. He just standing there waiting like everybody else. Two people behind, behind him fell out in the power of the Holy Spirit. He wasn't even looking at him. He turned around like, what in the world just happened there? Power of God was all over him. He said, God, what is this? He said, you leak. <laughs> because he was full to overflowing. I've had people come to me before after meetings. I just want to pray for you so that you'll be filled back up. I'm like, you don't understand. I didn't pour myself out. All I did was minister out of the overflow. Yeah. I've had Julie say, how can you preach that much? Because I'm not, I'm not emptying myself. Yeah, I give it all I got, but I'm still have filled with the Holy Spirit when I leave here. Yeah. I give you the overflow. Because if I give you everything, I'm going to be dead. <laughs> Ephesians 5.17 And do not be drunk with wine, for that is a debauchery but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now to be filled here means to be full or complete. If you are not full, you need to be filled. God will fill you up and then a day or two later, you're going to need to be filled up again. This word here doesn't mean be filled one time and done. It's be continuously filled nonstop. Right. You get in your car and you drive and drive and drive and never stop at the gas st station, what's going to happen? You're going to run out of gas because you never filled up. You have to get filled. If you drive and drive and drive and never stop and get the oil changed, what's going to happen? Your engine's going to lock up because you never did the maintenance. It's the same thing with God. Any church that makes room for alcohol minimizes the room for the Holy Spirit. If you don't have the Holy Spirit in your life, you're going to go find it somewhere else within the world. This is why it is so important to be continuously filled. Luke 1 15, for he will be great before the Lord and he must not drink wine or strong drink and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. This is talking about John the Baptist. Now, first of all, what this shows us is that there's absolutely no age restrictions to the Holy Spirit. I've watched five-year-old little girls get baptized in the Holy Spirit. I've watched little kids. Hey, now, can I pray for you? No, I'm good. I had one little kid in a tent meeting. I prayed for his, his, his brothers the dead night before, and he came. He goes, you're pushing these people down. I said, what do you mean I'm pushing them down? I said, what about this little girl right here? He goes, you couldn't have a child for us. <laughs> the, littlest, the littlest person in the entire tent. I looked at the other three. They're like this because they knew what happened the night before. So what I learned is being a children's pastor, I just said, give me your hand. They're willing to do that. And next thing they know, their eyes pop out of their head because they feel it going up their arm. The Holy Spirit is tangible. And God is no restrictor to age or anything like that. The filling of the Holy Spirit can happen to anybody. I've seen it happen, and I've watched him walk right back to the world. We had a young girl who came into our Bible study, and she was really attaching herself to our family. She called us one day and said, hey, I'm really having trouble with such, such thing. Can I come over? And God spoke to me and said she needs the baptism of the Holy Ghost. She needs power. So she came over. I walked her right through what the baptism of the Holy Spirit was. Now this girl was in the world. She'd seen a lot of things. Power of God hit her. She began to weep, speak in tongues. She came through. She goes, that's the craziest thing that's ever happened to me. It's the last day I ever saw it. She's still alive. But she went back and she never returned. I just think it's interesting that the Bible puts drinking of alcohol and parallels it with the filling of the Holy Spirit. 
We just quoted two scriptures from that. Luke 1 and 41, when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. So not only did it was prophesied in Luke 1 15, it was fulfilled in Luke 1 41. You never follow a gifting in somebody. The giftings and callings of God are without repentance. You follow people based on character, on who they are, how they live their life. This is why the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians to know those who you work with. I got really convicted this year about that. I'll just say I changed the people I listened to. Not because they were bad, but I didn't know them. Everyone has the same opportunity to the Holy Spirit. Everyone. I'm not anything special, promise you. Ask my kids. You're pretty special. Dang it, ask my wife. <laughs> I think you're special. <laughs> Acts 10, 44, while Peter was saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all those who heard the word. There's the connection between the word of God and the spirit of God. You will never have a move of the spirit without the word of God. It just, both of them have to come together. There has to be an emphasis on the both. I'm reading right out of the word with an emphasis on the Holy Spirit. It's both together. In this, in this uh, um, story, Peter had had a vision to go talk to this family. His name was Cornelius. He was a Gentile. He was not a Jew. And Peter, being the good Jew he was, did not associate with the Gentiles. As a matter of fact, you know what they called them? Unclean. So he has this vision of all these animals coming down in a sheep. And they're all what the Bible calls unclean animals. And God tells him, get up, kill, and eat. And he says, no, God, I'm not going to do that. And he says, you're going to disobey me? I've never done that in my entire life. I've obeyed your word. I hate to break this to you, but he wasn't talking about food. He was talking about Peter going to the Gentiles because it was the same exact thing. Peter, you've got to go. There's men coming. They're coming to take you to a Gentile. Go with them. They also called him the uncircumcised. As a matter of fact, at the end of the story, when the Holy Spirit's poured out on them, the Jews that went with Peter were bewildered that God would even do that to a Gentile. Okay. Thought that would go over better. I don't know if any of us are Jews in here, but, you know, that's good news to me. Okay. Acts 4 and 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and the elders, the Holy Spirit will fill you with the words to speak and the words of truth. Peter and John were uneducated, common men, but being filled with the Holy Spirit, they began to speak beyond their understanding and with boldness. When we were having that Bible study in our house and I had these kids and I thought things, this is, this is just common sense stuff. It wasn't common sense, they had no clue. Things I thought I could breeze through, they'd look at me and question, question, which was fine. Julie would say to me, now when they asked you that question, I know you didn't know the answer to that, but yet you answered today. How did you do that? I said, because immediately the Holy Spirit gave me the truth to tell them. They came in one time and, and they were all excited about this program for justice. Let's just say it was that. And they wanted to get our United States government involved in this situation over in Africa. And they were going to do this big, uh, lack of better words, it's kind of a bad word nowadays, but it wasn't so bad, kind of a protest, a, a demonstration to get the attention of our US government. I knew immediately by the Spirit of God that there was something wrong with this. But I knew that if I just came out and said that to them, they would reject anything I said. So I let it go and I went to prayer that week and I said, God, you've got to show me something that can reach them about this. Because I, I, I know that there, there's something bad about this. And I just happened across this young lady who was 18 years old. 
She graduated from high school. She went on a missions trip to Uganda. She came home from that mission trip, broke up with her boyfriend, sold everything she had, which probably as an 18 year old wasn't very much, and moved to Uganda and started an orphanage. And I began to tell them her story. She's now married, she's got, how many kids last time did she adopt? Eight. Eight kids, 18 kids that she's adopted, not including the orphanage that she runs. And I got done and I said, if you want to do something, be like this girl and go give your life away for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I said, as far as this thing you guys mentioned last week, I said, within a month, it will be exposed as bad. Within that month, one of the guys who was organizing it was exposed. Let's just put it at that. Now, I'm not a prophet nor the son of a prophet, but every now and again, the Holy Spirit does speak to me. Like I said, a blind old squirrel can find an acorn every now and again. Luke 1, 67. And his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied. The whole family, Zechariah, Elizabeth, and John the Baptist, all filled with the Holy Spirit, all began to speak, all prophesied. They didn't even have the baptism of the Holy Spirit yet. And I don't even think they probably had seven of the nine gifts even available to them yet. I mean, obviously prophecy was available. But there's a lot of them that weren't strongly in operation, let's just say that. The amazing part of this is Zachariah was silent for nine months. God turned him into a mute. He couldn't say anything. But the moment he obeyed God, and wrote John's name down for them to know. God went boom and opened up his mouth. Acts 13, 9 through 12. But Paul, no, Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you. And he will blind you, and you will be unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. The Holy Spirit gives you an understanding, and he gives you protection from all evil. He also guides you in how to deal in every situation you find yourself in. The Holy Spirit gives you joy in the midst of persecution, hardships, or challenges. Things in this world may get worse. Oh, let me just back up and say that again. Things in this world will get worse. But the Holy Spirit will direct you around all evil. I have a light. And it always shines. It shines in the day. And it shines in the night. And when the dark day comes and the sun isn't bright, I will still be shining because I have a light. The question is, do you have that light tonight? Do you have that light? We are in this world, but we are not of this world. If you are truly filled with the Holy Spirit, you will be filled with joy. And it doesn't even have to make sense. We have a guy in our church. He would probably drive the majority of you nuts. The man watched his 16-year-old son be killed in a car crash right in front of him. And he never lost his joy. Never lost it. I've never met a man with more joy than him. He probably drives a bunch of people nuts. No, I know he does. But the man has joy. He is full of joy. And he's full of the word. He was crying out to God after his son had passed away. This man walked up and began to talk to him about his son in his backyard. Ah, God sent him an angel to tell him his son was okay and he was in heaven. Acts 9, 17, so Ananias departed and entered the house, laying hands on him, him being 
uh, Saul. He said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you can regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. There is an impartation that happens through the laying on of hands. The Holy Spirit will lead you into all righteousness. He's not, he's no respecter of persons. He will reveal to you places and things that you couldn't think of on your own. He will show you areas in your life where there's unrighteousness that he can bring healing. The question is, are you filled? Are you filled? Are you filled? If your answer is, I don't know, then you need to be filled again. Because if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, I guarantee you, you know it. You know it. Do not think to yourself, I'm not worthy of the Holy Spirit. I guarantee you, you're worthy. If you bowed your knee and your head and your life to Jesus Christ and you've given and you love him with all your heart and you've given your life to him you are, that's the reason he died was for your sin the reason he went to heaven was so that the Holy Spirit could live inside of you the disciples were being pulled in many directions as their numbers increased they began to have neglect on people, and so complaints started to arise. So instead of stretching themselves thin and neglecting their own duties, they began to appoint some men to oversee different things. This is in Acts 6, I believe it is. They did this so everything could be properly organized. So it's not bad to be a person full of the Holy Spirit and be an organized person. There's a place for everybody. Fullness of the Holy Spirit is not standing behind a pulpit or in front of a great crowd preaching. It would be helpful to be filled with the Holy Spirit to do that, but that doesn't mean you're called to do that. But you can still be filled with the Holy Spirit. It empowers every single one of us to serve. I'm going to say that again. The Holy Spirit empowers every single one of us to serve. I have served the same church, the same pastor for over 20 years. Never to promote myself, never to gain any recognition, but to simply promote him, to promote God, and to promote that church. When I leave from that church and I come here, I am a representation of that congregation. I am a representation of that pastor. And I never want word to get back to him. But do you know what Aaron said? Which is why I stick with the word. I mean, number one, yes. I want to be a good representation of Christ. Don't get me wrong. But these men who they were choosing were going to be a representation of the disciples. The list of seven men were chosen. Interesting enough that the only one that is specifically pointed out is Stephen. Now if you read, they were all full of the Holy Spirit. So that's not to take away from any of the rest. But something was different about Stephen. You have to understand, not everybody operates the same. Look, I know I'm a different breed. I understand that. I'm fine with that. I don't care. I was actually talking to my pastor today. I was talking about something, and I, and, and I said, I don't know if they know how to deal with me because I don't think they've ever met anybody like me. I'm not promoting myself or building myself up. It's just I, I understand I'm different. That's okay. Sometimes that turns people away from me. You know, sometimes I, me and me and the tall one that actually leads. So the guy who's preaching and the girl who leads the worship. Do you know what the two of us would rather be doing? Sitting over in the corner away from everybody. This one here, this one here, those two there, they want to go out. They want to greet everybody. I'm like, look, y'all want to talk to me? I'm standing right here and I'm cool by myself. I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine. Do you, listen. Before I ever did this, there was a time that I couldn't have done, done this. There was a time in my life that I couldn't stand up. 
and preach in front of a group. I was terrified. I was terrified. Full of the Holy Spirit, but terrified to get up in front of people and knew I had a call to preach. So my God, how's this going to work? So my pastor came to me and goes, Aaron, I know you feel like you have a call to preach, but every time I put a mic in your face, you shut down. I thought, well, my God in heaven, yes, that is absolutely true. And then I looked right in his face and I said, that giant's coming down. And then I went home, got on my face and said, God, I don't have any clue how to bring this giant down. I need you to tell me what to do. And he said, every time you come into my presence, get on your face. Because that just sounds like how you overcome a fear of public speaking. It's just get on your face in the presence of God. It makes perfect sense. Perfect. It does. I, I know y'all ain't heard this story. Anybody else heard this story? Oh, yeah, really? <laughs> so it was Good Friday in our church, and, and, and we got carpet like this, and it was dead silent. You could have taken one of those little pins and dropped it on the ground that won't make any noise, and you would have held it all. And God says, if you'll shout victory right now, I'll finish it. And I thought... Have I do what now? I'm, I'm sorry, uh, uh, you breached Aaron's voicemail. Please leave a message. He says, well, do you want it or not? I said, well, my God in heaven, I'd rather fail falling on my face at least trying to do what I think God's telling me to do than sit here and do nothing. So I did. I shouted victory at the top of my lungs. I was telling this story at Luke and Heather's in North Carolina. Luke goes, I was there that night! <laughs> a month later, I was preaching to 9,000 pastors in Zambia. Oh, wow. A month later. Probably, I don't know, a couple weeks later, I was preaching my first sermon. I, I'll be honest, I, I shook like crazy during my first sermon. But I didn't shut down. Praise yes, praise the Lord. So like my pastor likes to say, any old bush will do. Or as I've said a couple times tonight, even a blind old squirrel can turn anything into an animal. But nothing I've ever done, well, in recent years, I won't say ever in my life because that wouldn't be true, but I don't ever try to do anything in, in church or the Christian life out of selfishness or my own personal gain. I don't ever try to kick down any doors to get invites. I'm like, God, I don't want to just go have a meeting for meeting's sake. I don't want to book a calendar because it'll look good to people. Like, I want to be doing the meeting that you called us to do. Because then the people are there who need to be there that will get impacted the most. Stephen was a man who was dead to himself. Most of us will look and think he was doing menial things. Feeding the, feeding the widows. Oh, great. You know what he would have been doing in today's society? He'd have been the janitor at the church. He'd yeah. have been sweeping up. Come on. I know if you're really called that if I ask you to do something, if you bark at me or if you actually go and do it. Yep. Come on. It's really a sign. The Holy Spirit empowers you to serve. That's why we have servers that are anointed. <laughs> well, they have to be anointed because I've heard of meetings where people have gone to the bathroom and fell out over top of the urinal. I'm just saying. That has happened. They've had to tell people. Look, we don't have speed bumps in the parking lot. So if you hit one, that's not a speed bump. <laughs> that's overflow. You know who oversaw? With, with Stephen like this, he saw many signs and wonders. He was making such a problem for the Jews that they actually killed him. And guess who oversaw his murder? Saul. Saul did. And Stephen cried out at the very last minute. He said, don't hold this sin against them as they stoned him. This forgiveness, I believe, was the catalyst that led to the conversion of Saul. You have no idea the impact you have on people when you're full of the Holy Spirit. No impact. You think, well, what could it ever matter? I'm telling you, 
Doesn't matter what your line of work is. Doesn't matter if you think it's insignificant. When you're full of the Holy Ghost, anything you do has significance tied to it. I've heard people say, oh, they just got a great calling. No, they don't. Your calling and what you were put on this earth to do is no better or worse than what I put on this earth to do. Because I can't do what you do and you can't do what I do. We all have to do what we're put on this earth to do. That's how it works. But you've got to be full of the Holy Spirit. Stephen, being full of the Holy Spirit, you know what he got to see before he died? God showed him, opened up the heavens for him, and showed him many things. There's a price that has to be paid to be full of the Holy Spirit. You can come to a meeting like this, get full of the Holy Spirit, but the question is, what are you going to do next? What are you going to do next? Because like I said, at some point you're going to have to be filled again. And this is what I saw a lot in the 90s of revival chasers. Always chasing after something. Oh, I got to go there. I got to go there. I won't look over at Debbie. You can still go there. Did you go there because God told you to go there? Well, I understand that. But you could go to one of those and not walk away with more of God, and then you just wasted your time. I'm not saying you did that. But a lot of people did. I thought, well, you're coming back no better than you left. I'm not talking about you. This woman put 180,000 miles on her car just coming to revival down in Florence, Kentucky. I don't know how desperate you are. That's desperation. Fully surrendering your life to God. Not just in words and action, but fully crucifying your flesh until every ounce of offense is gone out of your life. The Holy Spirit and offense can't dwell in the same body. Paul even spoke of being caught up into the third heaven and saw things that he couldn't even speak of. It's like when I eat Julie's banana bread. <laughs> That was really funny, guys. Come on. <laughs> In other words, when I eat her banana bread, it's like being caught up into the third heaven and I can't speak of things I see. Forget it. <laughs> Good night, moon. <laughs> but this is what the fullness of the Holy Spirit brings to you. Listen, when, when, when the Holy Spirit's moving, you can't mess it up, even if you tell it to everybody. But the, being full of the Holy Spirit unlocks the mysteries of the gospel and gives you a glimpse into the supernatural. Let me finish with this scripture, Acts 11, 23 through 25. When he, being Barnabas, came and saw the grace of God at the church in Antioch, he was glad. And he exhorted them all to remain faithful in the Lord with steadfast purpose. For he was a man, a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus and he looked for Saul. When you're full of the Holy Spirit, God begins to show you things that otherwise you would never, ever see. God began to show Barnabas things and people that he had never seen before, including Saul, that everybody disregarded because of his previous life. He was a murderer. He was a dismantler of the fullness of the Holy Spirit. He gets radically saved. And then he's on the backside of nowhere, kind of like David for three years making tents. But Barnabas saw something because he was full of the Holy Spirit. God will show you things in person in a person that otherwise many in the natural will overlook. When Samuel went looking to anoint the king, he went to David's house. And he looked at all these men and he thought, these are great men. And God said, nope, not him. Oh, he's strong. Nope, not him. Went through every one of the sons of Jesse. None of them. Please tell me you have another son. Because God told me to come here and ain't none of these boys it. Oh, yeah, we've got one little guy. But uh, he's out tending the sheep right now. Go ahead, go get him and we won't move until he gets here. David would have been overlooked in the natural, but he turned the nation back to God. Don't look on the outward appearance, but upon the heart. You may wonder, why in the world are you up here wearing a tie or do you wear a suit 
most of the time you preach. Because whether you like it or not, you will judge me before I ever get the microphone whether you're going to listen to me based on what I'm wearing. It's been proven. They actually say, say that, was it Gerald Ford lost the election because he wore a brown suit to the debate. Now, I'm going to mention a name. Don't freak out on me. It's just to prove a point. Tell me what color tie Donald Trump is always wearing. Red. Red. You want to know why? Because it represents power. That's why he does it. The Bible says man looks on the outward appearance. But we have to be full of the Holy Spirit and look beyond that. Nobody wanted anything to do with Saul. For three years, he's by himself on Tarsus. And Barnabas saw what nobody else could see because he was full of the Holy Spirit. We have to be full of the Holy Spirit. If you came here tonight, I hope you came for God to unlock your ability to receive more from him tonight. He gives the Holy Spirit without measure. It's all available to you. The question is, will you say yes? Will you say, God, I give it all. I surrender all. All to you I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but you washed me white as snow.